Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Robin Mitchell. I am mom to two young adults, a Hannah and Ben. And Hannah is 27 years old, and she was diagnosed with Tango 2 um, three months ago. So uh, we are new to Tango 2, um, and thank you for the warm welcome to this family. We really appreciate it. Um, I would like to introduce um, the next speaker. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce the next guest. Dr. Michael Sasher is a professor in the biology department at Concordia University and an adjunct professor at McGill University in the Department of Anatomy and Cell Biology. His laboratory focuses on the mechanism of membrane transport between cellular compartments and diseases related to defects in this process. Work which began as a research associate at Yale University. He discovered the trap complexes in yeast and identified mammalian specific trap proteins. Using genetic, biochemical, structural, and cell biological approaches, his group showed that they can play pivotal roles in membrane transport and have linked mutations in a number of trap genes to human disease. His laboratory recently began characterizing the function of Tango 2 using a variety of model systems demonstrating a role in both membrane transport and at the mitochondria. Please welcome Dr. Michael Sasher. Thank you very much for the invitation to come here. And um, first, let me apologize for my overly casual attire for uh, for giving a talk. I thought the memo said it was dressed down Monday, but uh, <laughs> I guess I got my dates wrong, but hopefully you'll still listen to me, even if I'm not wearing bare pants. <laughs> and actually that didn't come out sounding the way I wanted it. <laughs> even though I'm wearing a pair of shorts, I am. I'm dressed. I'm dressed. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll, I'll try. <laughs> as of tomorrow, right? <laughs> um, yeah, so, so <clears throat> I've studied rare disease in the past, not Tango 2, um, only recently Tango 2, and very infrequently do we get to interact with families or, uh, and, and never with children. Um, so this is actually quite a, a, a motivating experience for me to be here and hear about, to see some of the children, to interact with families and um, to understand and realize that this is more than just a interesting scientific question, what does Tango 2 do? Because it affects real, cute, adorable, wonderful children. So, uh, so we're, we're hopefully doing our part in, in trying to address that. Um, back in November on the online symposium, I talked about um, how proteins don't act in isolation. And if we don't know what a protein does, so for example, Tango 2, we don't know what it does. It's hard to start from ground zero like that. So what we, what we like to do is find out who does it interact with? Most proteins are gonna interact with something, somebody else. If we know what those interacting partners do, then we can start building a hypothesis of what our protein of interest does. And so that's the overarching theme of the work in my lab, uh, and hence the, uh, the, the title but I'm not really going to dwell too much on what these interacting partners are. I'm going to, it, it helped form a hypothesis that led to the work that I'm going to show you, which is uh, unpublished, more recent work from my lab. Um, and this work, I should say, has been carried out by uh, Paria Saadi, who's at the meeting here. She's intelligent, hardworking, dedicated uh, researcher in the lab. Um, and I would have said all those things even if she wasn't here. <laughs> but uh, she's really made this research, uh, I would say, take off. And you'll see the double meaning of that in, in, uh, in a few minutes. There are a few, so uh, there were great talks before me. I don't think I need to spend much time on background. So uh, I'm going to rely a lot on, on your remembering what earlier speakers today talked about. There are a number of questions that you'll see pop up in one way or another during uh, my presentation, the most important of which is the last one there, what does Tango 2 protein do? We don't really have an answer to that, but I'm still gonna go ahead with my, with my presentation, and then I'll, I'll wrap up and show you where we're, 
where we're headed with our work. So just quickly to, um, to talk about, it's the red button, right? Just gotta find the red button there. So I'm just gonna quickly remind you what this, of, of, of a couple compartments whose names will pop up for my presentation. So the endoplasmic reticulum or the ER and the Golgi, these are two uh, compartments in a cell that communicate with each other. Proteins get inserted into the ER, then they're transported in little vesicles that pinch off of the ER, they move to the Golgi, they get modified in the Golgi, and then the Golgi decides or helps to sort them to different places in the cell. Okay, enough said about those. Mitochondria you've heard a lot about. Um, so just for the purposes of my talk, fatty acids can be imported into, um, into the mitochondria where they enter a cycle called beta oxidation and they get uh, metabolized into, uh, to produce uh, cellular energy. So just quickly, where did Tango 2 come from? So it was in 2006 that a screen was performed uh, that identified 20 genes and they all got the name Tango which stands for transport and Golgi organization. And then they were just numbered, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so here's the, here's the table uh, of all the Tango genes. Now, the only point I wanna em emphasize here is if we know what Tango one does, or Tango three, or Tango four, or Tango five, it doesn't tell us what any of the other Tango genes do. They, they all have that name because they all, they all came from the same screen, but it doesn't mean that they all coordinate with each other to do things. Tango 2 can do something completely different than, than Tango 1 or, or other genes. Okay, so I just want you to keep that in mind. If you ever d dive into the literature and you find something, and you'll see some papers on Tango 1. Doesn't mean we know anything about Tango 2 at that point. So one thing we want to do is, is to start with is, is to say, to ask, what does Tango 2 look like? So this hasn't been experimentally verified yet, and I think Lena's lab is, is working on that. But there is software that can quite accurately predict the three-dimensional structure of a protein. So remember Sam talked this morning about um, the DNA being converted to messenger RNA and then amino acids build up that protein. But those amino acids are arranged in three dimensions. So what does it look like? So this is what Tango 2 would look like in three dimensions. So what does that tell us? Not really much of anything until we start asking what other proteins look like that. And so there's a software that can do that called DALI. And so I'm just showing you a couple of the, the hits, basically. So forget about the amino acid sequence. It doesn't have to be similar between Tango and these other proteins. Just the three-dimensional look. So one of, the, one of the hits is a protein that is this protein over here that binds something called acyl-CoA. That's a, acyl is simply a generic way of saying fatty acid, and CoA is a molecule called coenzyme A, and fatty acids are oftentimes bound to coenzyme A. You can think of CoA as kind of a, an activator of, of fatty acids, so to speak. It's, it's, what, uh, bring, it's, it's the form that they're in when they're being metabolized into, uh, into energy, and, fat, and CoA, CoA is gonna play a prominent role in, in what I'm gonna talk about, so keep that in mind. Another one of the best hits actually was an enzyme called phospholipase B. Phospholipase is an enzyme that hydrolyzes fatty acids from phospholipids. Okay, and I'll get back to that at the very end when I talk about some ideas of what Tango 2 might be doing. Uh, all this to say, Tango 2 might have some sort of an enzymatic role in the cell. And what that is, we're, we're not quite clear just yet. So we published a paper last year and we, we looked at, uh, this is how we got involved in Tango 2 research just looking at uh, the transport, the movement of proteins from the ER to the Golgi. And I won't get into the details of how we do it, but we're using a fluorescent marker, a cargo. So that fluorescent protein, it gives off light. We can follow that in a microscope. Um, and, and, uh, and all that fluorescent starts in the endoplasmic reticulum, and over time, we see it accumulate in the Golgi. And we can just measure the increase in fluorescence over time uh, in control cells, and that's in black, and you can see a nice steady increase in the, in the arrival of that cargo at the Golgi. And in cells taken from an individual with Tango 2 mutation, that's the exon 3 to 9 uh, deletion here, the homozygous one, there's a strong delay in the arrival of protein in the Golgi. We know it's due to Tango 2 because if we take those cells that are deficient in Tango 2 and we add a Tango 2 wild type gene, we can rescue that uh, trafficking defect 
to almost to the level of the control cells. So I want you to keep that in mind, because at the end I'm going to show you another trafficking assay, which rescues just about as well as the wild type Tango 2 gene, but we left the Tango 2 gene in the freezer for that experiment. We used something else to try and rescue this trafficking defect. So that's the only reason I'm showing it at, at this point. Okay, so, so we like to try and find out what other proteins interact with Tango 2. And again, I don't want to go into details here of, of the experimental methodology, but we fused a protein, a special type of protein, which I'm just going to represent as this blue blob, at one side of Tango 2 or the other side. You know, Tango 2 has a beginning and an end, so it's fused at one side or the other side of Tango 2. And if a protein comes close to Tango 2, then this blue blob over here will leave a mark on it. So then even if it separates from Tango 2, we can still fish it out because it had this mark left on it. Okay, so we, we put that protein on either side of Tango 2, and we expected to see proteins involved in the transport of material from the ER to the Golgi, and we didn't see that. So that was a little bit puzzling. What we did pick up were a lot of proteins, uh, mitochondrial proteins, and so that was interesting and made us think that Tango 2 might be associated with the mitochondria. But we also found a couple of interesting proteins that are involved in uh, releasing fatty acids from CoA. So like I said, acyl-CoA, that's the fatty acid bound to CoA. There are enzymes that can cleave off that fatty acid, and we identified a couple of them and suspect they might be interacting partners of uh, Tango 2. Now, I, I mention this because it's going to form the basis of a hypothesis, and we went to uh, a, a different model system than what we normally study in the lab. We normally work with human, human cells. Uh, this time we went to this model system, which is called Drosophila melanogaster. You may call it fruit fly. I call it those pesky little buggers that are in my kitchen when the bananas stay out for too long. And I guess Sam won't have that problem for another month because <laughs> you've got the green bananas right now. So give it a little bit more time and they'll show up. So. Now you're looking at this and you're, and you're probably thinking, so Michael, what is a fruit fly going to tell me about Tango 2? And I have to tell you that I was kind of skeptical at first as well. But what I hope to show you is that these are, these are uh, clinical uh, features that are seen in individuals with Tango 2 deficiency. What I want to show you is that the fruit flies also have many of these same clinical features. What's more, is there's a, sup a, a particular supplement that we've been adding into the fruit fly uh, food that they've been eating, which is pretty much alleviating all of the issues that they're having. So I'm going to dive into that data in, in just a few minutes. But first, before I get into it, and just to lead into my hypothesis here that we're, that we're uh, testing, is just let's look at this CoA, which, is, which uh, I've mentioned a couple of times here. So fatty acids are imported into the mitochondria on a molecule of carnitine. Then when they get into the mitochondria, they're tran that fatty acid is transferred over to CoA. So we end up with acyl-CoA, the fatty acid on CoA. It enters a process called beta oxidation, where a couple of carbons are shaved off at a time. That releases electrons. And in a complicated process, the electrons are used to generate cellular energy in the form of ATP. All right, so where does that CoA come from? The CoA. Uh, is generated in a five-step reaction starting with pantothenic acid, which is vitamin B5. So I'm just going to be referring to vitamin B5 today. Right? So vitamin B5 in a five-step process ends up generating CoA. So we're able to, so well, let's have a look at our hypothesis here. We're thinking, okay, Tango 2 might regulate the levels of cellular CoA or acyl CoA maybe by virtue of this interaction with these enzymes that hydrolyze acyl-CoA, there's a connection between Tango 2 and acyl-CoA. And what could that do? Well, from what I just showed you, if we play around or mess around with the levels of acyl-CoA, we could affect cellular energy because that's required in the mitochondria to produce energy. There's also a, a, a hypothesis or a, an idea that was put forth by Sam at one of our CZI meetings that proteins get acylated, meaning that fatty acid can be transferred to a protein. And that can affect the function uh, of proteins. And those proteins use acyl-CoA. That's the, the substrate that's trans the fatty acid comes off of 
the acyl-CoA onto the protein. So if we're messing around with acyl-CoA levels in a cell, we might affect several cellular processes, including the acylation of proteins and the production of energy. Okay, so now how are we going to test this notion? So maybe kind of naively we decided, what if we just throw in vitamin B5? It's a precursor to, to CoA. Let's throw in vitamin B5 into the, the food that the flies are eating. We have these flies with Tango 2 mutations. And let's see how it affects the behavior uh, of these Tango 2 flies. Okay, so here's a, I uh, hope it's, it's not too complicated, but I'll, I'll make it even simpler for you. As a scientist, we always like to know when half of something happens. So here what we're doing is we're, we're inducing or we're, we're starving the flies, and you all know that's a, a trigger for metabolic crisis. So that's the first thing we looked at with these flies. And let's look at where half of the flies survive. We're just looking at the survival of the flies over time. And so for the Tango 2 mutant flies, we get to the 50% the survival rate a little after 10 hours. For the control fly shown in uh, black, that's about double the time. It takes about 25 hours for half of them to die off. But interestingly, if we take the, the mutant flies and we add vitamin B5, that curve is now shifted significantly to the right. Those flies are surviving much longer now when they're fed uh, vitamin B5. So that's suggesting that it's the B5 is, is enhancing the survival rate of these flies with the Tango 2 uh, mutation. Okay, so that was pretty interesting. So then we went to what I like to call the creepy crawly assay. And to understand this, you have to understand the life cycle of a fly. So it starts as an egg, it hatches, you end up with a larva. The larva goes through various stages of maturation. This is all happening over a matter of a couple of days. We work with this one over here, the third instar larva. And then that eventually matures into, into the fly and the, the process uh, renews itself. So we decided to look at the movement of these larvae on, on dishes. And when I say we, by the way, I mean Perea, because there's no way I'm touching a fruit fly larva. <laughs> it's just disgusting. So, so Perea very bravely takes these larvae out and she sticks them onto these dishes and she looks at how they move around. So this is kind of complicated, so let's go through it a little bit more uh, slowly here. So just look at the black bars. This is the control larva. These are the Tango 2 mutant ones. And you can see right away, we're just looking at the distance that they move over a nine minute period here. So they're moving much less than the, uh, than the control flies. But when we added vitamin B5, that's shown in, in red, and you can compare it to the B5 treated controls as well, it's rescuing the movement of those larvae to the level that we see uh, in, in the control situation. And we, we think this is specific for vitamin B5 because we also looked at several other vitamins, vitamin C, B9, B3, and none of them seem to be rescuing that, that movement of the larva to the same extent as, uh, as vitamin B5 is rescuing. Now, Bria didn't only measure the movement over here, but she also made a, a, an astute observation. What I'm showing here, in, it's sped up over here. Don't worry, the, the larvae don't move that fast normally. That this is a control, and this is a Tango 2 mutant larva. And, and what, what you should notice is the controls tend to move in a more linear fashion. They'll move from left to right uh, on, your, on your picture over here. Whereas she noticed that the Tango 2 mutants seem to move in a more circular fashion. So to us, this suggested, Perhaps this is a form of ataxia in a, in a fruit fly larva, and the vitamin B5 treatment is also alleviating uh, this uh, circular movement of the, of the larva on the dish. Okay, so that's another interesting assay that vitamin B5 seems to be having a positive effect on. But we also wanted to look at the adult flies. Uh, by adult, I mean, what, they're 10 days old, so that's yeah, adult for a fly. But we looked at, see, we started looking at this one assay called a geotaxis assay. So here, you take the flies, they're in a, a plastic vial with no food, and we just knock the vial on a, on a hard surface, and all the flies fall to the bottom. And when they fall to the bottom, their instinct is to just climb right back up again. Okay, there's, there's probably a life message in there, but I'm not going to uh, get into that, because I'm not here to give a motivational talk. But the flies tend, when they hit the bottom, they want to start crawling back up. And so we make a finish line, and we ask how, what percentage of the flies cross the finish line uh, within a 10-second period. And you can see for controls, 80% of them do. For the Tango 2 mutant flies, less than 20% of them do. But again, when they're exposed to vitamin B5, 
uh, they, they're rescued to, to nearly the level that we see for the, for the control. So another uh, assay that vitamin B5 seems to be beneficial in, vitamin C was not rescuing anywhere near to the same level as, um, as vitamin B5 was. Okay, so that's, that's uh, if you jolt them down. But let's say we just want to watch a fly walk on its own without first shocking its system like that. So what, she, what Perea then did was put the flies just on a Petri dish and just watched them walk around on the dish and measured the distance that they're moving. So you can see here the control flies are, are moving, uh, what, 35 or so centimeters in a 10-minute in a period. Tango 2 mutants, again, moving much less than the, than the uh, control flies. And when treated, when grown in the presence of vitamin B5, it's being rescued, maybe not to the level of, of control, but a significant improvement in the mobility of the, of the flies. Now, there was something else that, that another astute observation she made uh, was if you think of the dish, it's nine centimeters in diameter. If we think of the, the middle five centimeters as the center of the dish. So she noted that the Tango 2 mutant flies seem to not enter the center of the dish as readily as the control flies would enter. Okay, in other animal systems, particularly with mouse, this is called an open field study. And when the mice don't go into the middle of the field, they're considered to be more anxious. So now I don't, we, we sort of uh, talked about this at, at one of our CZI meetings briefly, whether children with Tango 2 mutations have an increased level of anxiety. And I think it came out anecdotally that they don't. I'm not sure that's actually been looked at all that, uh, all that carefully. Regardless, maybe this is just a fly-specific phenotype, but it's just another phenotype that seems to be uh, rescued by vitamin B5. So I don't really know what an, what an anxious fly is anyways, <laughs> except to say it's a fly that hangs around the side of a Petri dish a little longer than, than a non-mutant fly. Uh, but it's another assay that seems to be rescued. Now, we also wanted to look at seizures because, as you know, seizures are, are a common feature of, of children with Tango 2 uh, deficiency. And so you might say, what does a fly having a seizure look like? And I would say to you, it looks just like what you think it would probably look like. So here's a video. Let's see if it runs. It's a, it's a fly um, on its back. Uh, we, we raise the temperature, and so it, it's, they fall on their back, and every so often we'll have uh, uncontrollable spasms. Um, so I'll stop that video right now. You have an idea of what a fly on a, on a seizure would, would, uh, would look like. So um, just to keep a couple of, of, of points in mind, this is induced by heat. So we raise the temperature to 42 degrees. The fly comes back to normal after the temperature goes back to room temperature. So I can pretty comfortably say that no flies were injured during the filming of this movie. And the other thing to keep in mind is it's a fly. And, and, and we zoomed in on it, and so it looks a little bit real to you. But to your eye, you would just see this little brown dot bopping around. So, but we induced the seizures in the flies, or, or actually we tried to induce seizures, I should say. Now, a normal wild type fruit fly does not experience a seizure when you raise the temperature. And you can see in our controls, none of the, the, the flies had a seizure. And not every mutation in a fruit fly will induce a seizure. But it just so happens that a Tango 2 mutation does induce seizures in flies. So about 60% of the flies within 120 seconds, that's as long as we do the experiment, about 60% of them experienced a seizure which was significantly reduced if the flies were first, were, were grown on uh, vitamin B5. The other thing that, that uh, Perea noticed was the time that it took to experience the seizure. So the Tango 2 mutant flies experienced a seizure in roughly 30, 33 seconds. The ones treated on vitamin B5 didn't have the first seizure till over 90 seconds. So we arbitrarily picked 120 seconds as the time of the experiment. But what if we would have taken 60 seconds as the time of the experiment. You wouldn't see any, muta uh, any uh, seizures in, in vitamin B5. So this is just to show you that it is rescuing or, or uh, improving the, the seizures, or reducing, I should say, the, the level of seizures. Not to the control levels, but uh, still it's a significant, a significant improvement over there. 
And, and this is one of the more important experiments, I think, that, that Perea did. And this was to ask, so on all the previous uh, experiments I showed you, those flies only knew vitamin B5. They were grown on vitamin B5. Their parents were grown on vitamin B5. They've only had vitamin B5 in their lives. But what could we give them a little shot of B5 and see some sort of an improvement? So remember now, this is again this, this geotaxis assay where we knock them to the bottom and they crawl up the side to the finish line. And so just to remind you that uh, the Tango 2 mutants about, in this experiment, around 20%, a little less than 20%, passed the finish line. The ones that had, grow, had been grown on B5 their entire lives, up to 70%, right close to where the control uh, flies would be. But we also put the flies on vitamin B5 one day, or two days, or three days before doing the experiment. And you can see in each case, we're getting a steady improvement. So even one day uh, of vitamin B5 treatment, it's not rescuing to the level of, of control at that point, but there is a significant improvement that we're seeing even one day or two days. So I think this is actually a, a pretty um, uh, important result uh, in terms of uh, B5, uh, B5 treatment for these, at least for the flies. All right, so going back to those, those phenotypes that uh, are seen in, in children, um, I've checked off four that we've seen and that we've seen a level of improvement, either to the level of wild type or, or significantly uh, improved. There are a few others that we haven't looked at yet. They're a little bit more challenging, uh, but you know, there's no experiment that Perea is not willing to try. So she's going to, the next one she was thinking of setting up is one to test the uh, uh, learning ability of, of the flies. It can be done. We're thinking of, uh, we have a way of maybe looking at rhabdomyolysis and, and cardiac arrhythmia is going to be trickier, um, but uh, that's why she's going to hang around the lab a little longer, I hope, so uh, <laughs> to look at those. But hopefully we'll fill in those gaps and see whether vitamin B5 is also in, uh, improving those. Now, this is all well and good, and you're probably all thinking, terrific, you know, I, I, I've got a kid with uh, Tango 2 uh, deficiency, and I can be empathetic towards a, even a fly that has a Tango 2 mutation, but show me something a little bit more relevant to me, all right? And so we went back to uh, the human cells, the, the fibroblast cells that have a mutation uh, in Tango 2. And remember, I showed you uh, this increase in the fluorescent cargo arriving in the Golgi for control cells, that's shown in, in black. And the Tango 2 uh, deficient cells have a, a, a large delay in that trafficking. And here what we did was we treated the fiber, we grew the fibroblasts in the presence of vitamin B5 for several days and then did this trafficking assay. And that's shown uh, in blue. So you can see that the rescue there is not quite to the level of control. That should remind you of the rescue that we got when we put in the wild type Tango 2 gene. We're getting, it, it seems at least in this functional, in, in, in this particular assay, I should say, that B5 alone is almost functionally replacing Tango 2. You don't need Tango 2 as long as you give enough vitamin B5, then at least in this one assay, uh, we are also looking at the mitochondrial defects that Lena talked about. Her lab and my lab also saw um, some changes in the mitochondria. And from a preliminary experiment that j just from a week ago, it looks at least like the mitochondrial numbers uh, are, are changing. Remember, the numbers go up in a Tango 2 mutant um, in the presence of vitamin B5. The, the mitochondrial numbers are decreased. They're fusing with each other a little, a little bit better. So. That all leads, I think, to a, to a large question, which is too large to fit onto this, uh, to this slide, so I shrunk it down for you. And that is, what is the mechanism? What, what is vitamin B5 doing <clears throat> to improve all these assays that we're seeing in, in, the, in the human cells and particularly in the flies? And you might be thinking, well, between this talk and Christina's talk, I don't really care what the mechanism is. It sounds like a B-complex vitamin or a multivitamin with B5 in it uh, might be something worth considering. I'm not a clinician. I'm not, not going to make any recommendation that way. Uh, Christina made it, so I'll, I'll rely on hers. But uh, you might not care what the mechanism is, but I'll tell you why you should care. Because if we understand what the mechanism is, we might come up with a way that's even better than vitamin B5. B5 looks great, but maybe there's something better. Maybe there's something in combination with vitamin B5 that's better than B5 alone. So we really need to be interested in 
How is this working? And in order to answer that, we really have to answer this question, what is Tango 2 doing? So we, we, unless, until we know what Tango 2 is doing, we can't really answer the question. So I could end my talk right here and tell you, I have absolutely no idea what Tango 2 is doing. Nice to see you. I'll see you in a couple of years, I hope, and maybe we'll have some more information at the time. But I'm not going to leave it at that. So I'm going to tell you a few things, a few ideas that we have. So remember I talked about this, this hypothesis of, of SAMs that uh, maybe it's affecting the isolation of certain proteins that might be contributing to the phenotypes. And so Sam's hypothesis was, well, Tango 2 might, maybe it's a deacylase. Maybe it removes that fatty acid from a protein. And when Tango 2 is deficient, we can't remove the fatty acid from the protein, and that causes the protein to not behave properly, to not function properly. So we looked into that, and uh, we set up a deacylation assay in, in vitro. So what we did was we took two proteins called APT1 and APT2, these green lines, and these are, you don't have to know what they are, they're just proteins that are known to have deacylation activity. We took another protein called RAB11, just happened to be lying around the lab, and it doesn't have any known function in deacylation, that's shown in red. So you can see the increase in signal over time for the positive controls, APT1 and APT2. RAB11 is blocked, you can't see the red line so well, it's blocked by four purple lines there, and what are those? Well, that's Tango2, increasing amounts of Tango2. Right, so you might look at that and you go, okay, well, it's not a deacylase. And you might be right. Um, but we don't want to leave any stone unturned. And so there are some other ideas where how can Tango 2 still be a deacylase and still show us something that looks like this? Well, maybe Tango 2 itself needs to be modified for it to be functional. And so to do that, we're purifying the Tango 2 from another system. We usually use bacteria. They're nice protein-producing factories. We're using insect cells, human cells, to try and purify Tango 2 and see if, if those cells will modify Tango 2 such that it, it'll function in this assay. Maybe we're doing the wrong assay. There's a few ways of doing this assay. Maybe this isn't the right one to do. And uh, maybe we need higher concentrations of Tango 2. Maybe it's a weak deacylase. Uh, so there are a few things that we're still doing to pursue that avenue. But regardless, um, it could still affect the acylation of proteins and their function, but not by acting as a deacylase. Maybe it's acting further upstream. Remember I told you it interacts with proteins that regulate the levels of acyl-CoA. So if we just look at your standard reaction of uh, a protein that gets the acyl group on it. So remember, acyl-CoA is where that fatty acid comes from. It gets placed onto the protein, and we're left with coenzyme A as one of the... Uh, the products of this reaction. There's enzymes that, that carry this out. Well, what if Tango 2 is regulating somehow the levels of acyl-CoA within a cell. And in the absence of Tango 2, maybe there's too much acyl-CoA and proteins are getting over -acylated. Well, how does the vitamin B5 fit into this scenario? Well, for many enzymes, um, the, pro the, the, the products of reactions can sometimes inhibit the reaction itself. So for example, what if coenzyme A stops this reaction from happening? And remember, vitamin B5 produces coenzyme A. So maybe, and we don't know that this is the case, I've looked into the literature and it's not clear whether coenzyme A actually inhibits this reaction. So that's something we have to address. But this is a cute little scenario here where when we overproduce, when we feed vitamin B5, we're building up the levels of CoA and maybe it's stopping protein acylation that would have normally taken place when, uh, when Tango 2 is, is, is deficient. So that's another aspect we're looking at. And the last aspect that I'll talk about is maybe it's affecting phospholipids itself. And what I mean by that is you have to think back to this structure uh, and this phospholipase. So here's a, your basic phospholipid. It's got two fatty acids shown here in green and this so-called polar head group. They arrange themselves like this to form a phospholipid bilayer. Within that bilayer are proteins that need to function. Now, sometimes under certain stresses, the fatty acids on these phospholipids have to be changed to allow the proteins to continue to function properly. And phospholipases are enzymes that can come in and cleave off one or more of those fatty acids and allow other enzymes to come in and put a different fatty acid on there, maybe a, an unsaturated or a saturated fatty acid. So the cell has the ability to respond to various conditions or stresses by changing the, the, the fatty acids that are in the phospholipid bilayer to allow the proteins to continue to function. And remember, 
Tango 2, one of the best hits based on its structure, is to an enzyme called phospholipase, phospholipase B. And so we're addressing whether Tango 2 might act as a phospholipase as well by doing a lipidomics analysis where we're just looking at all the phospholipids in a cell, control cells, cells that are deficient in Tango 2, unstressed, stressed, we'll start with starvation stress, and see if we're finding changes in the, in the phospholipids that are in the cell and whether we can relate that to, to the function of Tango 2. So just to, to quickly summarize what I've shown you here is we've got this fly model system which has a number of phenotypes that are shared uh, are similar to those seen in children with Tango 2 disorder and vitamin B5 seems to be alleviating those issues. We don't know how. We're taking a number of unbiased and biased approaches to try and address what the function is using a bunch of different model systems. And um, as I was putting my slides together, if you'll indulge me for one more minute, this occurred to me and I think uh, Christina sort of had that on her slide and I see now it's in the, uh, the booklets that, that everyone got, but I was thinking, you know, it was 2006 that the Tango 2 gene was, was first identified or published in that screen, and it was another 10 years before, you know, Sema and, and Felix started publishing uh, the, the manuscripts on uh, linking Tango 2 to, to human disease. The foundation was a, a Tango 2 Research Foundation established around 2018. There's been a steady stream of paper. My counting might be off here as well. There's already a bunch in 2022, hopefully more to come. Just to point out, like, the progress is quite impressive from over a four-year period from the establishment of the foundation until now, right? And just imagine what the next four years could, could possibly bring. And, uh, you know, nobody can make any, any promises about anything, but we can certainly make progress. And I hope at the next uh, uh, in-person meeting, I'll have more to say about vitamin B5, what it might be doing, what Tango 2 itself uh, might be doing. So hopefully that'll uh, continue to progress at the rapid pace that, that things are, are moving right now. So again, uh, I've mentioned uh, Perea a number of times. She's the one who's really uh, spearheaded all the, the fly work in the lab. Miroslav Milev is a research associate, longtime associate in the lab who does the mammalian, the mammalian work. Maza is a new PhD student who's working on the enzyme assays and the lipidomics. Uh, and various other students in the lab uh, who have contributed to aspects of the work. And the fly work was really started with the help of Kiara Gamberi when she was at uh, Concordia. She now moved her lab to South Carolina, but we still are, are closely collaborating with Kiara on, on the uh, fly work. So thank you for your attention, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions.